Good day, everyone, and welcome to Sunday's Thoughts from the Word. And today we're going to be sharing from the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers, chapter 14. And while you're looking that up, either in your Bible or on your device, we want to remind you that if you have a prayer request, or you want information, just go to wingsoffaithministries.ca. You can submit your prayer request there, or if you're looking for information, you'll find everything that you need to know at that site, wingsoffaithministries.ca. <clears throat> I'd like to also remind you that if these messages are ministering to you, be sure to like them either on Facebook and YouTube, and we'd also invite you to subscribe, and that really helps us out. So we appreciate if you would do that also. Years ago, I used to attend a, or was a home study prayer meeting. And I remember at the time, we were studying with a minister who I became very close with over the years. And we were um, looking at the text of the book of Hebrews. And I remember one major thought that I came away with out of that study of the book of Hebrews is that along life's journey that we will hit forks in the road. Now these forks can be brought about by circumstances, they can be brought about by crises, uh, different things can bring these forks about, but at different intervals of our life, we will run into a time when we have to make choices and then decide whether we're all in those choices or not. And that's what I want to talk about today. In fact, the title of my message is The Fork in Life's Journey or The Fork in Life's Road. So we're in numbers. We'll be going over to John chapter 21 in just a few minutes. But first of all, Numbers chapter 14 and beginning at the first verse. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry. And the people wept all that night. And all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become booty. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let's choose a captain and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the Israelites. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Junah, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to the congregation of the Israelites, the land that we went through as spies is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are no more than bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But the whole congregation threatened to stone them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? And how long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them. And then we're going to go over to the Gospel of John, the fourth book of the New Testament, and we're going to chapter 21. 
and beginning at the first verse. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you no fish? Have you? He answered him, no. He said to them, cast your net to the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging a net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. Then down to verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? more than these he said to him yes lord you know i love you jesus said to him feed my lambs a second time he said to him simon son of john do you love me he said to him yes lord you know i love you jesus said to him tend my sheep he said to him a third time simon son of john do you love me Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I say, say to you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you don't wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Father, may only the words I speak this day be the truth and may only the truth be perceived by those who hear these words in Jesus name. Amen. In Israel's history, in the book of Exodus, we read about the return to Egypt of a fugitive, a man who had been gone for over 40 years, fled because he had killed an Egyptian. But this same fugitive came back to Egypt with a message, let my people go. And that message was accompanied by both signs and miracles, plagues that hit the nation of Egypt. And the message found a chord in the hearts of the Israelites and they made a decision that they would adhere to the message of Moses and follow him and we know that after 10 plagues that hit the nation of Egypt the last being the death of the firstborn that the nation of Israel followed this fugitive Moses out to the desert, then miraculously crossed a sea and went into the desert, heading for Mount Sinai. 
So they made a decision. But the question became, how committed were they to the decision they had made? How committed were they to the vision Moses had brought to them of a new land, a land flowing with milk and honey, in which Yahweh would lead them through the desert to this land of Canaan. And as the Israelites began their journey, after crossing the sea, seeing a momentous miracle, they head to Mount Sinai, where they will see in glorious splendor a demonstration of Yahweh physically demonstrating himself. And in that camp, as they are at the foot of Mount Sinai, it is not long after this showing that we see the cracks starting in their commitment to both Yahweh and Moses. They had left Egypt physically, but Egypt had not left their hearts. When Moses went up onto the mountain to receive the law, and he was gone for an extended period of time, it did not take long for the cracks to show in the Israelite community. Already, they had fashioned an idol in the form of a calf that they were going to acknowledge was their God because in their minds, their leader Moses had taken too long up on the mountain. From the Red Sea to Sinai, from Sinai, they head to the desert of, desert of Paran, Kadesh Barnea. And on that journey, just from Sinai to the wilderness of Paran, the Lord says they had tested him already ten times by their behavior and their lack of commitment to the project they had decided to commit themselves to. God had tested them, tested their commitment. And each time that they were brought to the test, their behavior did not match a full commitment to getting to the promised land. There was grumbling, there was complaining, there was second guessing, all sorts of questioning about the commitment they had made. And now, in the desert of Paran would come the moment of truth, a real test. Moses had decided he would send out 12 scouts. They would scout in areas that later would become Judea, Samaria, and as far north as in Jesus' time, Galilee. They would scout out the land. They were looking for two things produce and people. They would scout out what the land produced and they would scout out the people living in that land to find out what type of fortifications they had, what type of people they were. So they would have some idea of what they were up against once they made the commitment to invade the land. And after an extended period of time, these 12 spies come back. And they give a report to the community. And they're all in agreement about one aspect of their trip. And that is that Yahweh's promise of produce has been fulfilled. The land has everything that they need to live on. And they actually bring some fruit of the land back to show that the land is a productive land, that it'll produce the food needed 
to sustain the community. So there's no argument about that. The problem comes when the second part of the scouting report comes back, and that's about the people of the land. Ten of the scouts report that the seven nations that lived there, the tribes that currently inhabited that land, had fortified cities, walled villages, people that were bigger and stronger than the Israelites. And according to these 10 scouts, there was no possible way that an invasion of the land would reap a good outcome, that they would fall by the sword of these nations. Two of the scouts, Joshua and Caleb, they do not argue the fact that the nations living there have an advantage. Yes, they have their food, they've got water, they do have a natural advantage. And yes, they probably do have walled villages and fortified cities. There's no argument as to the task at hand where the difference of opinion comes is, was the God of Israel strong enough to give victory to the Israelites over these seven nations? Ten of those scouts did not believe it possible. They thought that the inhabitants of that land were just too big, too strong, too capable, too well supplied for Israel to dislodge them. Joshua and Caleb felt another way, not arguing about the physical advantage, but believing that how Yahweh had performed for them and had done miracles in the past at the Red Sea in Egypt and in the wilderness, and after his demonstration at Mount Sinai, that their God was well able to bring them into the land and dislodge the inhabitants. And so the nation faced a crisis. Do we or don't we? Do we make the commitment to invade these people? Or do we retreat? You see, when one makes a commitment in life to undertake something or to do something, even our commitment in our relationship with God, we are going to be tested on it. We are going to have crises in our life where we have to make decisions. Are we fully in or are we not? And so I read to you from Numbers chapter 14, how the community of Israel cried all night. Of course, they didn't want to blame themselves for that commitment they had made in the first place. It was far easier to blame Yahweh, to blame Moses, and to blame Aaron for the commitment they made because it doesn't look like they were really wholeheartedly in the commitment to begin with. And so they decide that they don't want to do this. And when one makes a decision that you don't want to go ahead, that you're not fully in, chances are you're going to end up retracing the steps of your life that brought you to that point. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. For the next 40 years of their life, they would do nothing but retrace the steps that brought them to the wilderness of Paran. If you're not willing 
to change your life than you sit with your life. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. They were not willing to change their life. They were not committed to the project. And so now they were stuck in the life that they were currently living until they died. I read to you from John chapter 21, probably the final meeting between Jesus and the Apostle Peter. Three years prior to John chapter 21 and that meeting, there is a meeting that takes place between these two men, which is very similar in a lot of respects. It's recorded in Luke chapter 5. And it's almost the same scenario. In Luke 5, John, or Peter, John, James, a couple of other people are fishing. And like John chapter 21, they had fished all night with no result. And I'm sure prior to this meeting in Luke 5, Peter had heard Jesus. He knew of him. Otherwise, he would have never given away his boat for Jesus to preach in. So obviously he had heard of Jesus, but not had that one-in-one -one encounter. And after Jesus has preached his message in Luke 5, he tells Peter to take the boat out one more time. Peter's been a fisherman a long time and knows very well that nighttime is the best time to catch fish. But because Jesus is Jesus, and Peter has some respect for him at that point, he says he'll do it. And of course, he and his partners are astounded at the amount of fish they catch as his boat and his partner's boats are sinking because of the volume of the catch. And Peter realizes now that he's in the presence of at least a prophet, if not the Messiah. And his first words are, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. But Jesus replies to him, from now on, you won't catch fish, but you'll catch men. And it's at that point that Peter makes a decision. He makes a commitment. And Luke says he left his fishing behind and became a disciple and a follower of Christ. But Peter's life in many ways in the next three years will resemble in many ways, Israel, when they walked out of Egypt. In other words, there was a commitment there, but Peter still had in his mind how this was all going to turn out. He had his own agenda. And that's revealed in the pages of the gospel. Peter was quick with his words about his commitment. But sometimes the walk didn't always match the talk. And he's confronted by Jesus about the fact that he has his own agenda along with that decision to commit. But like Israel, every decision we make, every commitment we come to is going to be tested. Something will happen a crisis will befall us, 
And then we have to decide if we're really committed to what we've undertaken. And for Peter, that crisis will come in the courtyard of the high priest. When all of a sudden his life, like Israel in the wilderness of Paran, Peter will face a crisis in which he has to make a decision. Do I or don't I? Three times he is given the opportunity to affirm his commitment to Christ. Am I in or am I not in, in this project? And three times, Peter cannot make himself make that commitment. And when you don't make a commitment, you don't move ahead in life. All you do is retrace the steps you've already been walking. And in John chapter 21, just like the nation of Israel who wandered 40 years in the desert retracing steps because they weren't willing to put themselves fully into the commitment they made, so Peter, we find in the first part of chapter 21, is retracing his steps. I'm going fishing. I'm going to do what I've been doing all along. I'm going to retrace the life that I thought I left. And the results of retracing those steps were exactly as they were three years earlier when he first met Jesus, he caught nothing. But unlike Israel, it's a new testament. There's forgiveness. And so Peter will once again catch a boatload of fish, 153. But once again, just like on the shore at the Sea of Tiberias, he will once again be on the shore of the same lake and have to make a decision. And three times, Jesus will ask him, do you love me? Are you ready now to make a commitment? Because it's not only about the relationship, do you love me? It's about the mission that's going to go with it. Feed my sheep, tend my lambs. And get ready to live a life that will not be your own. Three times. Does he do it? Or does he retreat? And Peter, this time, is all in. What he couldn't do fully the first time, probably a lot of reasons behind that, not really having a full understanding of who Jesus was or what it would lead to. There's lots of reasons why people don't make full commitments. But this time he was willing to. And we can see that willingness because it unfolds for us in his life in the book of Acts. He's willing to face Jewish authorities and Jewish people in Acts chapter 2 something he wasn't willing to do in the courtyard of the high priest. 
He's willing to stand and testify about Jesus Christ, knowing it may cost him his life. But he's all in now. In Acts chapter 10, he's willing to give up his Jewish heritage and his Jewish way of thinking on a roof when he's confronted about things he believes. Why? Because now he's committed. He's made his mind up. He faced his crisis in life, and he was willing to go the next step. And his life from that point was never the same. No more fishing. No more retracing the past. He was all in. Life is about decisions. And we have to make those decisions in the course of our lives, whether we like it or not. We're faced with situations in which we have to make decisions. In our relationship with Jesus Christ, with God, in our lives, there will come times when we have to make decisions. And if we decide we're all in, then life will change. There is a promised land. There is a different life ahead of us that God brings us into. But then we can always retreat. And retreat causes the same outcomes that happened to the children of Israel and the apostle Peter when he failed in the courtyard. You simply retrace the steps of your past. You never go on. always fighting the same battles, always complaining about the same things, always dealing with issues you can never get rid of because you were never willing to be all in. The fork in the road. The fork in life's journey. You take one path or you take the other path. One leads to new life. The other leads to a continuous circle that you've already been going on. Today, you may be listening to me and you may be in a crisis where you have to make a decision. Or maybe you've been in one. And like Peter, you just couldn't make yourself take the risk, make that decision. Or maybe you know there's one coming up. I'm here to say to you today to take that challenge, to be all in with Jesus Christ. One can only go around a mountain so many times, living the same type of life. But Christ offers something different. Christ offers something where you leave the past behind and you go on to something new, a new path, a new life, a new journey. And Christ is with you. And it doesn't matter who the enemies are, because that doesn't matter, your God's bigger. And it's not a challenge or a commitment or a project that you're going to fail at because Christ guarantees that the life he gives you leads to the outcomes he wants for your life. But one must make that decision to be all in. I leave you these words today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the holy name of Jesus, we ask for your Holy Spirit to anoint this word that has gone forth. Those who hear it, who are facing crises and decisions in their lives, we pray that this word would minister to their hearts. For those who are listening who do not know you as Lord and Savior, 
We pray that even now they would make that decision, Lord, to commit to you and to be all in in that commitment, to realize that you are who you say you are. And Lord, we just grant by the Holy Spirit that you would minister and that you would bear witness with those who hear and make that decision. And we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Have a good day, and we'll see you next week.